very much for allowing me to be here today. It's good to see you all again. Um, it's been a whole, many years since I've been here. Um, but I do remember the inside of your church building very well. That is something that definitely comes back to mind. Um, hopefully the video will tell you everything, well, a lot of details of what has happened since I was here last. Um, just sharing what the Lord did in Cambodia, the ministry that we had over there, and then how the Lord has redirected <coughs> me to Ukraine. Um, originally, ever since November, my plan was to leave for Ukraine like Tuesday of this week because I was planning you guys would be my last meeting and I would go to Ukraine. And I got that I got to the states on August fifteenth in two thousand nineteen, so this would have been right around a year. But the Lord allowed something called coronavirus to come and visit us, so my plans have gotten changed, um, and that's not I mean. My coworkers are over on the field, so it is possible to get into Ukraine. Right now, I'm just working on raising the additional support that I need to get to the field. So I think the biggest thing would be if you would just pray that the Lord would open the door when he wants it to be open for me to go. I don't know what his timing is. Um, I don't know what he might have for me to do here in the States first. But he is not having me leave as of right now in August, unless he brings in another 35% really fast. So... Um, Anyways, you'll hear that on the video. The video says August of 2020. I'm not leaving in August of 2020. But otherwise, everything else should be pretty much up to date. So I just want to let you know that. And again, thank you very much for allowing me to come and for just partnering with me financially and also for prayer support as well. For I know the thoughts that I think toward you, saith the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil, to give you an expected end. Small Steps A five-year-old girl recognizing her personal guilt and calling on Jesus to forgive her sins. A ten-year-old kid becoming burdened by the understanding of Jesus' great sacrifice in dying on the cross. Then, her personal surrender to follow God anywhere in the world. A 15-year-old young lady grudgingly submitting to the Lord's call on her family to the mission field of Russia, but then becoming enthralled by the people, culture, and language, and burdened by the desperate need for missionaries in that area of the world. I could go on and on, but these are just a few of the turning points in my life that have led to where I am today. Although there have been what some may consider to be detours, each stage has had a present and future purpose. My name is Rebecca Fruin, and the next step that the Lord has for me is to serve Him in Ukraine. You know, five years ago, when I went to Cambodia, I expected that I would be there for the rest of my life. However, the Lord has brought me to another major crossroad, and each of the situations He allowed me to experience in Cambodia, and even previous to that, has been further preparation for this next phase of service for Him. I went to Cambodia to work with three other families, my parents, Ron and Tina Fruin, plus the Tom Johnson family and the Jason Carpenter family. I had the opportunity to teach two groups of students at Cambodia Baptist College, a school that my dad started to help the teens and young adults in the church develop skills that would help them serve more effectively at their churches. English was my main responsibility, with music as a close second. We covered all sorts of other interesting things though, like computer, math, history, and even science. Most importantly, though, I got to establish relationships with the students and encourage them to grow spiritually. Another great opportunity I had while in Cambodia was to use my EMT certification as I assisted Dr. Tom Johnson with several medical clinics while I was there. These clinics also allowed the students to grow in sharing the gospel and translating between English and Khmer. We hosted a couple of COLA combat events with visiting groups of college students from America where the students got involved in a focused, week-long evangelization outreach 
targeting teens. I loved working with the children at the church in Tachmau. While my dad would be preaching upstairs to the older children and teenagers, I ministered downstairs with the children up to the age of 10. We sang songs, did crafts, and learned verses that focused on the Bible lesson for the day. These kids and their spiritual futures are some of the biggest burdens on my heart, especially since I've left Cambodia. But, you ask, how did God use any of that to even begin to help you prepare for life in Ukraine? Well, <laughs> let me tell you. After leaving Cambodia, I spent a lot of time seeking God's next step for me. I corresponded with various individuals and visited different places to find the direction the Lord wanted me to go. Finally, through a series of seemingly random but clearly God-orchestrated events, I visited Ukraine. I was able to use my Russian to communicate competently and in some pretty intense conversations throughout my two weeks there. From the very get-go, I could see how God had used so many situations in my life to bring me to this point. My time in Russia, the years I spent at Camp Joy, the last five years of teaching English and working in a Bible college setting, and various gifts and desires that the Lord has given to me tie together so well in this ministry, and I can only stand in awe of what the Lord is doing. In addition, I was amazed at how the Lord allowed my relationships with my fellow missionaries to begin to form so easily. I anticipate working with Pastor Tico Agamalian, his wife Lena, and their family, as well as with Pastor Derek Thomas and his wife Julie. During my recent trip, I visited various aspects of the ministries that these faithful missionaries have either started or are involved in. Ukraine is currently an open and ripe field for missionaries. With a population of almost 44 million, it is ranked as the 33rd most populated country in the world. Almost as large as Texas, it is the biggest country in Europe. Well, excluding Russia, of course. People from all over the world are traveling through Ukraine as well. In 2018, there were over 75,000 foreign students in Ukraine from countries like India, Morocco, Israel, and many of the surrounding countries that formerly made up the USSR. At the church plant and Bible study in Kiev, I had the opportunity to meet a few of the students from Nigeria and Iran. One of the exciting things will be seeing how God works in the hearts of these students to take the gospel back to their own countries. One of the ministries that I got to observe during my recent visit was the Slavic Baptist Institute out in Khmelnytsky, about five hours away from the capital city of Kiev. This institute operates four separate weeks a year, allowing the students to meditate over their studies for three months before coming in for a new session. An additional benefit is that these weeks provide multiple getaways of spiritual training and encouragement for the students throughout the whole year. The missionaries have recently begun three extra weeks of training every year that are specifically designated for pastors. For my first interaction with the Institute, I had the opportunity to sit in on the sessions and hear the heartfelt teaching of the visiting pastors as they encourage the students to devote their lives in service to the Lord, whether at home or abroad. At meals and in the evenings, I got to hear the respective stories of some of the students as they personally shared burdens the Lord is laying on their hearts or specific challenges they are going through. What a blessing it was to encourage them in their walk with the Lord. Later in the week, I even got to use the skills I had picked up in Cambodia by teaching English to some of the students. These areas of counseling and teaching English are simply two of many ways I look forward to being used of the Lord at the Institute. Another ministry that I saw was the church plant that the Agamalians and Thomases have started in Kiev. Although the work only began in September of 2019, the church is already growing. It is situated in the midst of a university district, and many of the students have traveled from other countries in Europe, Asia, 
and Africa to study there. It is exciting to imagine the possibilities that the Lord may be opening up. Sunday services, Thursday night Bible study, outreaches into the nearby university, and English lessons to build contacts within the community are just a few of the ways that I anticipate contributing to this church family. During my conversations with the two missionary families, I heard about additional outreaches they have planned for this next year. Medical clinics are scheduled for 2020 and 2021. Summer church camps and English camps are in the works for this upcoming summer. Outreaches to various people groups in nearby countries are being prayed about and researched. While outreach to nearby countries may be a little bit more difficult in certain areas of the world, it holds great potential here in Ukraine. Let me explain. The capital of Ukraine used to be the capital of Russia back when the Rurik dynasty started creating the first Russian state in the 9th through 13th centuries. And while today, in Ukraine and in several of the surrounding countries, their national languages are widely spoken. Many of these countries communicate in Russian as well, especially in the big cities. I am thrilled that the Lord has given me the privilege to join the work that he is doing in Ukraine. I am currently aiming toward getting to the field in August of 2020, and I would like to ask that you would pray about this for me. Please, Pray for laborers to the field of Ukraine, that the hearts of the Ukrainians would be receptive to the gospel, and that the churches in Ukraine would be strengthened to serve the Lord wholeheartedly. Isaiah 6.8 says, Also, I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send, and who will go for us? Then said I, Here am I, Send me. Volunteers, uh, volunteers. And uh, I'm going to read uh, just a, uh, uh, a verse here from Joshua. Joshua chapter 24, verse 15. You can see from your outline, we're way down on the bottom. And you say, well, he'll be done in five minutes. Well... Well, you don't know me, do you? <laughs> uh, and uh, you don't know me if you thought that for a second. Uh, uh, but uh, let me read Joshua 24, verse 15. Uh, because this uh, subject here is about serving the Lord. And uh, uh, what a nice day to preach a message like availability on a, uh, when we have a young lady here that uh, is making herself available for the master's use. So uh, Joshua 24, verse number 15 says this, If it seem evil unto you to serve the Lord, choose you this day whom you will serve, whether the gods which your fathers served or which were on the other side of the flood, or the gods of the Amorites in whose land ye dwell. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. And uh, let's pray. Father, I thank you uh, for the wonder of your word, and I pray that you'll uh, loosen this stammering in tongue and uh, Allow me to speak forth truth that would speak to hearts, and, and may each one of us have that uh, prayer that as for me and my house, and we will serve the Lord. And Lord, this is a, uh, something we have to make a choice about. It does, doesn't just happen unless we make a willful determination that we're going to do something. So Lord, help us to choose to make ourselves available for your use. And Lord, I pray that you'll give me now the words to say that would speak to the hearts of those that are here. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, of course, Joshua says he's make that choice. He said, uh, uh, if it seem evil to serve the Lord, that's one thing. But he said, choose you this day whom you will serve. Now, I'm going to tell you something. Now, listen carefully. You serve somebody every day. Uh, you, you, uh, for the most part, our lives are wrapped up around serving ourselves and serving our family uh, wives are very good at serving their family they'll uh, wives are very good at putting their children first and their husbands first uh, many wives are some wives are selfish and they put themselves first and uh, yeah, but most uh, women have a, 
uh, uh, that sort of a spirit about them that they're uh, certainly my wife does uh, she gives herself to serve herself or her husband and and uh, children and and uh, even grandchildren she wants to serve them but uh, uh, overall we need to make sure that we're serving the Lord and we need to make a choice and it uh, wouldn't it be something if you got up in the morning and uh, before you put your uh, little feet on the floor next to the bed you said Lord I want you to know I want to serve you today. Give me something I could do for you. You say, would you pray that prayer? That's a great prayer. I remember especially early in my Christian life when I got right with the Lord, I prayed that prayer on a daily basis. And you know something? It seemed like every day I had an opportunity to say something or to do something to bring glory to the Lord. But it starts with a choice. It starts with us submitting ourselves to God and God's Spirit. God and His Spirit is working all around us today. We're in contact with people. We don't know who they are. We don't know what they're going through, but we're going to come into contact with complete strangers, and we don't even know it, but God wants us to say a word. God wants us to do something. God wants us to just to somehow influence that individual in a particular way, and not necessarily passing on a track. Sometimes people don't need a track. People, sometimes people just need a word of encouragement. Sometimes people need to say, I, I, I appreciate you. You know, oftentimes we go through life, we don't think anybody appreciates us. But you know, we can have a positive influence on other people for the Lord if we make ourselves available. Imagine how the Holy Spirit can use you. And imagine how you can serve him in some way. Well, God wants us to make that choice. So that's part of the number one, making our availability uh, to serve the Lord. And God wants us to have a willing spirit about serving the Lord. As a matter of fact, part of that first line, God wants us to have a willing spirit, a submissive spirit, and a Christ-like spirit. And I've got some verses that are going to speak to each one of those things. Now, to do this, we must have that willing service, and that willing service means that we need to put God first. 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 15 said, Sanctify the Lord your God in your hearts, and be ready always to give answer to every man that asks you the reason of the hope which lieth in you with meekness and fear. Sanctifying the Lord in your heart is setting the Lord apart and setting him and making number one in your life and always ready to give an answer. You say, well, what's the question? Well, you'll find out. Uh, you'll find out that, uh, and by the way, the question is kind of confusing sometimes because sometimes you think, well, that I know that answer. I've got to give them the gospel. Sometimes God doesn't want you to give that three-point sermon of the gospel. Sometimes God just wants you to let them know that, that you'll be their friend. Sometimes God just wants you to, yeah, by the way, uh, uh, if we establish those relationships with other people by serving them, uh, that window opens up where we get a chance to share the gospel. And it means something to them. Because they know we really care. We really care. And it's not just about getting them to get saved. By the way, Jesus loves the lost and he wants the lost to be saved. And we need to love the lost, and we want them to be saved. But we don't turn it off if they don't get saved. We love them anyway. So Peter said uh, this, Sanctify the Lord God in your hearts, and be ready always to give answer to every man the reason for the hope that lieth in you with meekness and fear. Some of you that are here on Wednesday nights know that right now we're going through a soul winning uh, 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 series. We're, we're, we're going through how to put our track together. And uh, we're putting a track together, the, the five things that the lost need to know. We're putting this track together, and we have these verses. And why are we doing this? Uh, oftentimes, people are scared to death. Somebody's going to ask them, well, what do you mean? Or how to, and, you're, and because you don't know the message, you're afraid to say anything. A friend, young and old, we should know enough about the gospel to be able to share the gospel with someone. So we're, we're preparing our own church track. And by the way, if you want to see the last church track we put together, there's one in the entranceway. It's, a, it's on the back of a, a little folder that says, uh, uh, with an outreached, outreached hand, we're, we're changing 
some of the some of the verses and things like this. But we're going to make a new one for this body. I did that at the beginning here. I think one of the faults of the churches today is that churches aren't teaching people how to reach people with Jesus Christ, how to share the message. If you don't know what to say, it it's, it silences you. You feel like I, I don't I don't know what to say. By the way, if somebody inquired about their soul, would you know what to say? You should know what to say. You should know what to say. And that's why we're working on this. We want everyone here to be able to win, win a soul. To share what needs to be shared. To say what needs to be said so an individual will be saved. And so you need to put God first and sanctify the Lord God in your heart. And, say, and by the way, sanctifying, say, that's my purpose in life, to glorify the Lord. He's number one. I'm going to sanctify and put him first. Matthew 16, verse 24. Five says this, Whosoever shall save his life shall lose it. Whosoever shall lose his life for my sake shall find it. Uh, there are people today that are on the mission field because they put Jesus first. And they thought they had a life. And now their life is taking Rebecca Fruin to the Ukraine. Who would have guessed that? Uh, uh, but when we give the Lord our life, who would have thought I'd be in the ministry? i got classmates, still don't know what I'm doing here. But, but you know, I gave myself to the Lord, and, and I sanctified him, and now I'm here preaching the gospel. And uh, you sanctify the Lord God in your heart. He's going to use you in some way. That doesn't mean you're going to be in the ministry. It doesn't mean you're going to the mission field. But it does mean you're going to be what God wants you to be where you are and wherever that is, whether it's on the mission field, whether it's behind a pulpit, whether it's uh, at your job site whether it's just uh, heading up your family and being a good neighbor and a good friend to those around you. Luke 16, verse 13. No man can serve two masters. Either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he'll hold the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. What does it mean to serve God and mammon? Well, just what it, means, just what it says. You, you, you serve, your, your job centers around your paycheck. And uh, my job is my paycheck. No, your job is to serve the Lord. Yeah, a paycheck may be part of that, but quite frankly, we need to put the Lord first. So, God wants us to choose to serve him. To do that, we must put him first, we, and we must follow him. Jesus wants us to follow him. Jesus said unto them all, If any man will come after him, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. That's the submissive spirit. And we saw, number one, we must choose, that's the willing spirit, and now following him, that's the submissive spirit. Luke 12, 35. Let your loins be girded about, your lights be burning. And ye yourselves like unto men waiting for their Lord when he returned from the wedding. And when he cometh and knocketh that they may open unto him immediately. That's the idea that, that we should be having our lights burning and ready for the Lord's return. And uh, ready for to be used by God. And that uh, we might receive him readily. Are you ready for the rapture? That's a good question, isn't it? Uh, 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 if the rapture were to take place right now, I mean, well, let's put it this way. Suppose I would tell you, God's given me a little word of knowledge. It's a small one. In five minutes, the rapture is going to take place. We're all going to stand before him. And, you know, uh, and you, first off, you think I was crazy. But if you got over that and you actually believed me, would you ha have to be doing some heavy praying uh, about sin that's unconfessed? Would you want the Lord to meet you the way you are right now? Have you got some unconfessed sin? Uh, have you got some hatred? Have you got some anger? Have you got some sin that you haven't dealt with? Well, that'd be a frightening thing. You know, I'll tell you something. I can lay my head on the pillow every night and say, Jesus comes. Can you? Every Christian should be able to do that. Every Christian should be able to lay your head on your pillow in peace because you're at peace with a master. And he might take you tonight. I don't know that. I'm free later this week for a funeral. No, just kidding. But it'd be nice to, nice to be able to lay your head on the pillow and say, I'm ready. I'm ready, Lord. Even so, take me. And uh, Jesus wants us to follow him. And that's that submissive spirit. And Jesus wants us, and Paul, by the way, gives the exhortation here. So the first exhortation was of, 
uh, of uh, Peter, the second exhortation of Jesus, and the third one here is of Paul. And he said in Philippians chapter 2, verse 4 and 5, he said, Look not every man on his own thing, but every man also in the things of others. Let this mind be in you which was also in Christ Jesus. Philippians 2, verse 20, I have no man like-minded who will naturally care for your estate, for all seek their own, and not the things which are Jesus Christ. And by the way, uh, that section there in Philippians, Paul is talking about Timothy, and he's, ta he's praising Timothy uh, for his like-mindedness who naturally cares. And you know what that all that points up to this? We have to have a submissive, a willing spirit, a submissive spirit, and a selfless spirit. We got to put ourselves last to Jesus first. Selflessness. Let that mind be which was in Christ Jesus uh, that did what? Put others first. Let that mind, uh, Paul's talking about Timothy, I have no man like minded who will naturally care for your state, uh, for all seek their own, not the things which are Christ Jesus. And he's giving a commendation next to Timothy. And he's sending Timothy. And he's describing himself there as well. Now, listen, the availability that God requires of us to have a willing spirit, submissive spirit, selfless spirit, and the available uh, 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 then means we have these things. Now, this is your outline. This is where we're starting, right on the bottom of your outline page. We must have a loving spirit. Those things aren't, aren't going to work out above unless we love. And God wants us to have a loving spirit. Galatians 5 verse 13 says this, For brethren, ye have been called to liberty, only use not your liberty for an occasion of the flesh, but by love to serve one another. Isn't that wonderful to be saved, freed from sin? Oh, I'm free, free, free. I'm not bound to sin anymore. Now what are you supposed to do now that you're free and not bound to sin? You're, now you're to, by love, start serving one another. And, and so the availability of, of being used by God starts right with your heart. You have to, and God wants us that we have a loving spirit towards others. Some people look at others and they think nothing. We should look at others and think that we love them. Galatians 5.22, but the fruit of the spirit is love. First fruit is love. Joy, peace, long suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith. Those are the fruits of the spirit, but that very first fruit is the most important one. A loving spirit. God wants us to love. To love him and to love our fellow man. John 13 verse 35. By this all men shall know that ye are my, my disciples. If you have love one to another. That love that displayed in churches. Now I'll tell you something. I know this is a fact as a pastor. And as a deacon in the church. One of the things that confounds the lost is the love that Christians have for other Christians. I mentioned about the fact that, that maybe somebody wants to support Rebecca Fruin. Maybe some of you already have missionaries you support. Your lost relatives can't understand where your head is. They think you're nuts. You give to church? You support missionaries? What's wrong with you? You must have been brainwashed. By the way, there's a lot of people in this world think Christians have been brainwashed. No, they've been spirit washed. And because they've been spirit washed, they have a love, a loving spirit towards others. They want to be a blessing to them. And by that, all men shall know you are my disciples because you love one another. That's what convicts the lost when they see us loving one another. Romans 8, 28. We know that all things work together for good for them that love God, to them who are called according to his purpose. Romans 8, 28 is a popular verse. Uh, some of you might have that on your refrigerator. It's a good refrigerator. By the way, did you know there are some verses that are meant for refrigerators? And you say, why? Because you're always looking at that refrigerator. And, uh, and the first thing you said, and that's a great verse. I'll read it again. By, uh, and we know that all things work together for good them uh, love God, to them who are called according to his purpose. That's kind of hard to uh, understand, uh, except to know that when your car breaks down, God still loves you. And when things that happen in the negative, we can all say, this is still going to work out for good. And so when it happens, instead of looking for the bad, look for the good that can come out of that. Maybe it'll teach you to trust the Lord a little bit more. So number one, we need to have a loving spirit. Number two, 
We need to have a selfless spirit. 1 Corinthians 9, uh, I've got to read a few extra verses here, 9, 16 through 20. For though I preach the gospel, I have nothing to glory of, for in, uh, necessity is laid upon me, and yea, woe is unto me if I preach not the gospel. For this I do this thing willingly, I have reward, but against my will, the dispensation of the gospel committed me, what is the reward then? You know what that's saying? If the only reason you're witnessing is because you think you got to, you don't deserve a reward. And if you're only coming to church because you have to, why should he reward you? You don't even want to be here. So he said, well, I'm coming to church. I don't want to be there, but I sure hope he's happy that I'm there. Well, listen, he's happy you're there, but you're not going to get rewarded for it. You get rewarded, as he says there, he said, we get rewarded because we're doing it because we want to do it. Because we want to do it. Uh, or necessity laid upon me. Woe is to me. This is 1 Corinthians 9, 17, uh, 16 and 17. If I preach not the gospel, I do this thing willingly. Verse 17, I have a reward. But if it's against my will, the dispensation of the gospel committed to me, what is my reward then? Verily, that when I preach the gospel, I may make the gospel of Christ without charge, that I abuse not my power in the gospel, for though I be free of all men, I made myself a servant unto all, that I might gain the more. And unto the Jews that became a Jew, that I might gain the Jews. To them that are under the law, as under the law, that I might gain them that are under the law. And what he's talking about, he says, listen, I am going to give the gospel without charge. And, and, it, and, and I'm not going to, uh, by the way, what it says there, I'm not going to abuse that power. Do you know it's a privilege to share the gospel? The Holy Spirit's going to empower you as you share. He said, I'm not going to abuse that. I'm not going to. He said, I'm going to do that because I love the Lord. John 10, verse 15. As the Father knoweth me, even so I know the Father, and I lay down my life for the sheep. This is all talking about a selfless spirit. We saw first you need to have a loving spirit. Second, you need to have a selfless spirit. John 10, 17. Listen to these verses now. Therefore doth my Father love me, because I lay down my life, that I might take it up again. No man taketh it from me, but I lay it down of myself. I have the power to lay it down. I have the power to take it up again. This commandment I have received of my Father. That is Jesus himself speaking. He says, I've got my life. I have the power to lay it down. I've got a power. I've got, and I have the power to take it up. But he says this. He said, uh, I have power to take this commandment I have received. He said, no man's going to... Do you know, they didn't kill Jesus on Calvary. Jesus gave his life on Calvary. By the way, there's, a, there's, a, there's an interesting twist to this. Those that are theologians here are, are like to think about things in a spiritual state. Uh, you know, the wages of sin is what? The gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. The wages of sin is death, okay? You say, well, Jesus died for us. He paid our wage for us. Yeah, but he, but he was so holy that he more than paid our wage for us. Now, I'm going to give you something crazy. Now, this is just because I'm crazy. I can say crazy things. I haven't gone to a Bible college, so I don't have to. I can get away with saying crazy things. I honestly believe that on Calvary, they did not kill Jesus. I believe Jesus gave up the ghost. I believe because he was so holy, so holy, and the wage of sin is death, and because he did not, he was holy, that they couldn't have killed him. He had to lay it down. He laid it down, and he took it back up. You and I are tainted by sin, aren't we? Sin and death have passed upon all men. And listen, sin and death was something that, that uh, was laid upon Jesus on Calvary. It wasn't laid upon him at birth. Our sin, uh, the wage of our sin was laid upon him. And he laid down his life to carry our sins far away. <laughs> and he rose, and he rose to give us life eternal. Oh, see, now that's an untrained person could get away with saying. Listen, uh, so number one, we have to have that, uh, that uh, loving spirit. Number two, we need to have that selfless spirit. To lay down our life for other people. And by the way, 
Uh, no man can make you lay down your life for other people. No man can make you bless other people. But you could do it. You could lay down your life for other people. Jesus did for you. Will you lay down your rights, your life for other people that you could be a blessing to them? And friend, that all comes under that selfless spirit. Do you have that selfless spirit? Or do you keep putting yourself first? And then a ready spirit, eager spirit. First Samuel chapter 3, verse 9. And therefore Eli said unto Samuel, Go lie down, it shall be. If he call thee, thou shalt say, Speak, Lord, for thy servant heareth thee. So Samuel went and lay down in the place. By the way, that's a great passage. You should read that passage. It's in 1 Samuel chapter, and starting all the way up in chapter 4, all the way down through. And what we're looking at, that text there, is the, is the call of Samuel. Eli was the priest. And now God was going to do something different. He was going to speak through Samuel. And so Samuel's laying in bed, and, the, and, uh, and, uh, and he hears uh, 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 someone, uh, uh, as he's laying down, he hears the voice of the Lord. And, and he hears that voice of the Lord. It's a powerful voice. He said, uh, and uh, Samuel, as a matter of fact, first Samuel, let me turn over there. First Samuel chapter 3. I hate to turn there because then I'm going to get bowed down here. Uh, sometimes I can't, but I'm not going to turn there. First Samuel chapter 3, verse 4. And, uh, and uh, uh, the Lord calls Samuel. Uh, and, uh, and he woke up and he thought, it was, he thought it was Eli, the priest. So he ran in and said, say to the priest, did you call me? He said, I didn't call you. He three times. He went in a third time. Finally, Eli said, that's not me. It's got to be the Lord. He said to, he said to Samuel, tell, tell the Lord, here am I, and see what the Lord's got to say. And you know what? Uh, the Lord had something to say to, 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 to Samuel. And ultimately, Samuel was called to be his witness, wasn't he? He was a great spokesman for God. And uh, Samuel was almost afraid to tell Eli because he knew that this was the end. By the way, part of what God told Samuel was that Eli is going to be judged and his house is going to be judged. But I'm going to speak through you now. And so in 1 Samuel, 1 Samuel chapter 3, verse 10, he said, Speak, Lord. And the Lord did speak to him. The Lord did speak to him. But you know what? Samuel had a ready spirit. Do you have a ready spirit? Are you willing to let the Lord speak to you? You know, I should have had started this whole sermon with this one. Are you ready to let the Lord speak to you today? Because the Lord might speak to you today and say, you know, young man, I want you in the ministry someday. I would love to have you serving me someday as a missionary. I, I want you to be a pastor someday. I want you to be a Sunday school teacher someday. I want you to be a missionary someday. I want, you know, God... God, listen, the question is, is do, you have a, do you have a ready spirit? Do you have an eager spirit to hear what the Lord's got to say? Now Samuel, he was confused. He said, what is this thing? I don't even understand it. And then he found out it was the Lord. And when the Lord said it, a little bit of fear struck him. But Samuel was a great servant of God. Do you have an eager spirit? First Samuel, or Isaiah chapter 6, verse 1 through 13. I'm kind of running out of time here, but that's a long text in Isaiah, in the year Uzziah. And, uh, and uh, uh, in that passage of Scripture, uh, the Lord spoke to him. Matter of fact, it says in verse 5, uh, a matter of fact, in verse 4, Then the posts of the door were moved at the voice of him that cried. The house was filled with smoke. And then I said, Woe is me, I am undone, because I speak with unclean lips. I, I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. Mine eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. And by the way, that was the call of Isaiah. And he was so confused and so confused. That, and uh, he was struck where he could not even speak. And then an angel came in verse 6. This is 1 Samuel chapter 6, verse 6. One of the seraphim said unto me, having a live coal in his hand, which he taketh the tongs off the altar, he laid it upon my mouth and said, Lo, uh, this hath touched my lips and taken thine iniquity away. Thy sin is purged. And then in verse 8. This is a great verse. And I also heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send and who will go for us? Then I said, Here am I, send me. And he said, Go. That's a wonderful passage in Isaiah. It's about the call of Isaiah and that using him mightily. But you know what? 
Uh, he had an eager spirit and was willing to serve the Lord. Do you have a willing spirit, an eager spirit to serve the Lord? You see, it requires all of these things. We must have a, a loving spirit. We must have a selfless spirit. We must have a ready spirit. And now, number four, we must have a generous spirit. Second uh, Corinthians chapter 8, verse 2 through 5. How that in great trial of affliction, the abundance of their joy, and in their deep poverty, abounded unto the riches of the liberality. For to their power, yea, I bear record, yea, beyond their power, their willing of themselves, uh, praying for us with much entreaty, we would receive the gift and take it upon the fellowship of the ministering of the saints. And this they did, not as we hoped, but they gave first their own selves to the Lord, and they, this by the will of God. And Paul is writing this letter to the church in Corinthians. By the way, you know, I read that book of 1 Corinthians. I preached through the book of 1 Corinthians. And when I got done, I was fed up with the church in Corinthians. Matter of fact, I heard about a church one day that was named uh, uh, First Baptist Church of the Corinth. And I thought to myself, who would want a name like that? That church in Corinth was a dirty, stinking church. I mean, they, they, Paul had all kinds of trouble there in Corinth. He corrected, he corrected, he corrected. It was years later that I preached through 2 Corinthians. And you know what 2 Corinthians is? It's a wonderful epistle where Paul writes and he commends them for taking that strong letter of 1 Corinthians and changing and repenting. I shouldn't have waited so long. Now Church of Corinth is a pretty good church. First read, I thought it was pretty bad. And then after I realized that they had taken the rebuke of God, they taken they had a humble spirit and they 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 had a generous spirit. And now this church that at one time was divided over Paul or Apollos had given him a love gift and it was so much more than he could count on. He said, your gift to me was so generous, I can't believe it. I can't believe it. By the way, we'll be taking a love offering up for pastor years later. No, just kidding. He said, I can't believe it. And so he commends them because they had such a generous church spirit. Most churches that are doing something for Jesus Christ are churches that have a generous spirit. And even if their numbers are small, their offerings are big. And even if their numbers are small, they support missionaries. Boy, what a reputation. I pray Ambassador Baptist Church gets a reputation of being a generous spirit. A church that gives beyond their ability because they love the Lord Jesus Christ. Oh, I hope so. And then lastly, a humble and willing spirit. Uh, Titus chapter 3, verse 1. Put them in mind to be subject unto principalities and power, to obey magistrates, to be ready to every good work. And part of that submissive spirit, that humble spirit, means we uh, submit ourselves to principalities and powers. That's not so easy today. We've got a lot of wickedness in high places today. Second Timothy chapter 2, Paul speaks there. The servant of the Lord. By the way, are you a servant of the Lord? If you're saved, you're to be a servant of the Lord. The servant of the Lord must not strive, but be gentle to all men, apt to teach, in meekness instructing those that oppose themselves. If God peradventure will give them a repentance to the acknowledging of the truth, that they may recover themselves out of the snares of the devil and are taken captive him by him at his will. You know, uh, 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 listen, uh, when we're dealing with the lost, we should have a humble spirit and a willing spirit because, quite frankly, many of the people that we're dealing with need to repent. And you know what God's attitude towards those people? It's not a lightning bolt from heaven. It's not a whip and a rod. Listen, the servant of the Lord must not strive and be gentle. You know what your spirit should be to people that are living deep in sin? You need to, to have a gentle spirit and a teaching spirit and a kind spirit in meekness instructing those that oppose themselves. Boy, I thought I was supposed to chew them out. No, you're supposed to have a gentle spirit and you need to take the word of God in a soft, 
to soft, kind way, teach them the truth about Jesus Christ. Do you have a humble, willing spirit towards the lost? Or do you want to beat them up? And Fred, I'll tell you something, that I know Christians that want to beat the tire out of some of the lost people around them. They're not the kind of ones that are ever going to reach them or help them. Gentle to all men, apt to teach, patient, in meekness, instructing those that oppose themselves. If God peradventure will give them repentance to acknowledging the truth, they may recover themselves out of the snare of the devil who are taken captive by him at his will. I see that last part? Remember this, when we're dealing with people that are bad, right now, understand something. They are in the snare of the devil, and they are captives of the devil, and they're operating according to his will. What's God's will that we tell them about Jesus and love them and get them saved? It's not God's will for us to go beat the tar out. It's not for us to take the whip to their back. Oftentimes, those sort of people know they're jerks and they hate themselves and no one cares. Friend, uh, are you a servant of God? Are you willing to do what God wants you to do? Uh, God wants us to be available and have a willing spirit, a submissive spirit, and we need to have a, as we're ministering them, we need to have a loving spirit, a selfless spirit, a ready, eager spirit to minister to them and to minister for the Lord, a generous spirit, and a humble spirit. Uh, and so we end our, our little lesson that we were going through on availability. And I pray it's been a blessing to you. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for yourself and your son. And Lord, Help us to be available for your use. And I pray this uh, conclusion now to that message is spoken to hearts. Bless us now. And uh, Lord, uh, we just thank you for this time together today. We pray a special blessing on the missionary here today. In Jesus' name, amen. And we're going to close with...